All right, in this video, I want to talk about another one of the 3.1 homework assignments. I broke 3.1 up into two dis different sections, empirical rule and calculator function stuff, because there's a lot of information, as you can see, by the fact that there's six videos on this stuff. Anyways, I already went over the empirical rule homework in a different video, so here's one on the calculator function stuff. Uh, you got eight questions here. First comment I want to make is some of these, they're going to look different. right? On your quiz this week, I will say, in her math one, I mean, I won't give you this exact example, but I'll tell you that something is normally distributed, and I'll give you the mean, and I'll give you the standard deviation, and I'll ask you to draw the pictures just like you've been doing, and then I'll ask you questions like, what is the probability they randomly selected scores less than 57? That's all fair. That's all fine. Expect to see something like that on your quiz. I will not say this. If you're curious, this is mathematical notation for saying this exact same thing. In this statistics class, I typically write things more in English and less with the mathematical jargon, but they mean the exact same thing. The capital P means what is the probability that, and then inside the parentheses is the probability you're trying to figure out. And this is saying X, the thing you don't know, a randomly selected score, is less than 57. That's the exact same thing that this is saying, just in mathematical shorthand. You don't need to know that. I guess in theory, either one of these would be sufficient, but I'm telling you that English is what I'm going to test you upon in this class. Less than 57, well, that's easy enough. You might think you should use your empirical rule, but you shouldn't because you're in the 3.1 calculator functions homework. So the first question is, should this be the normal CDF function or the inverse norm function? Every single one of these are either going to be normal CDF or inverse norm. It's up to you to figure out which, and that's probably the hardest part. Keep in mind that it's normal CDF anytime you are trying to figure out the area underneath the curve. So if you know from several videos ago that the probability that one observation falls in a given range is one of the two interpretations of the area under the curve, then maybe you can recognize that all three of these are asking you to find the area underneath the curve. So all three of these are going to end up being normal CDF questions. Another comment here, you're going to be using your calculator. What is the probability that a randomly selected score is less than 57? Use normal CDF, you get this answer. Your calculator is going to output this as a decimal like 0.1573 like you see up here. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I know. Don't type that in. Make it a percentage. No, actually. On the quiz, I'm going to ask you to format this as a percentage, 15.73%. But on this homework assignment, unless it explicitly says, I, the computer, want a percentage, leave it as a decimal. So the correct answer here will be 0.1573. I mean, that's not the right numbers, but if this is where you got it from, it'll be something that's not formatted as a percentage, but is instead left as a decimal. Same for these next two. Second question. Uh, assume the scores on the verbal portion of the GRE follow the normal distribution. They give you the mean and the standard deviation. And then they say scores on the quantitative part also follow a normal distribution. And here's its mean and here's its standard deviation. And knowingly, one of these questions is about the quantitative portion, which is the second thing it gave you information about. And then the other question about is about the verbal portion, which is the first thing it gave you information about. So that's really annoying that they give you the information and then ask you the questions backwards. So be careful about that. At any rate, find the score of a student who placed in the 80th percentile on the quantitative reasoning section of this exam. This is hard. This is often when I teach this class, I don't tell students what this corresponds with and I kind of let them figure it out on their own because I have more office hours and we have more time in class and questions can come up and I can help them then. But in your class, since the only learning you get are these videos, let me tell you exactly how you'd answer this question. 80th percentile. That's something you haven't seen in a while. You saw that back in 1.6. Maybe you remember that what the 80th percentile is defined to be is the point within your data that's so high up that it's higher than 80% of observations. That's what the 80th percentile means. So this is asking you, what would the score have to be on the quantitative reasoning part of this test to be so high that it's higher than 80% of the scores. Picture your normal distribution down here and then picture a number way over on the right. You don't know what that number is, the number underneath the curve. You don't know that. You got to find that. But what you do know is that number is so far to the right that the area left of it, the area that it is above, is 80%. And so maybe that clues you in that you're going to be using the inverse norm function on your calculator here. And since it's giving you the area to the left, it's one of the easier inverse norm questions. Inverse norm, 0.8. And then the center and the spread that correspond with quantitative reasoning. Again, be careful that you pick the right one. That'll give you a number. You won't have to worry about, is it a percentage or a decimal? Because it's neither. Right? It's a GRE score. It'll be a number, not a percentage or a decimal. 
And they'll type that in here, and apparently they want you to round to two decimal places. Often they tell you how to round. If they tell you how to round, follow the directions. If they don't tell you, just keep a bunch of decimal places. Because right? what happens is the people who build these problems build in a tolerance, and they're always different. But if you give them a whole bunch of decimal places, then fine. Even if they were really picky and said your answer has to be within 0 .001, if you gave them five decimal places, we're good. Right? But if they tell you to round to two decimal places, round to two, and you're good. Um, read this question. I think you'll find this is also an inverse norm question, but it'd be nice if you could recognize that without me telling you that. You'll have to do that later on this homework assignment. Question three. So on this one, this is a little bit challenging. You have four questions. They're all dealing with, what, Batman? The ride? Uh, wait, no. Where did that come from? Oh, here it is. I knew I saw that somewhere. Um, Batman ride at Six Flags. Whatever. Point is, they're all dealing with 10-year-olds. doesn't matter that they're 10-year-olds. They're all dealing with some population, and that population is normally distributed. They tell you the mean, and they tell you the standard deviation. Maybe you can already imagine your picture. What is the probability that? You can stop reading right there. When these start with, what is the probability that? If you know that one of your two interpretations for the area under the curve is the probability that something happens, and a randomly chosen observation falls within these bounds, then you know when it says, what is the probability that they're asking you to find the area? Anytime they're asking you to find the area, use the same calculator function. And you can figure out what that calculator function is. Use it, get your answer, and type it in up here. Note that it wants your answer as a decimal rounded to four decimal places, so not as a percentage, as a decimal. What is the probability that? Maybe that's a hint there of what you're doing. Then this one's a little bit different. If the tallest 10% of kids are considered very tall, What's the cutoff for very tall? What height is so far to the right underneath your distribution that only 10% are to the right of that value? And you can figure out the calculator function you're using and be really careful with the input of that calculator function. Note, it's not gonna be 10%. And you can figure that out in inches, around to two decimal places, type it in here. Finally, this one's asking what proportion of all 10 year olds, go back to the two interpretations of the area under the curve and I think you'll, you'll see that this is one of those two interpretations. What proportion of all 10-year-olds can't go on the ride if the height requirement is 54 inches? This question is kind of hard. They ask it sort of backwards. I think it would be more clear to the student if this first sentence came first and then this came second. Figure out which calculator function you're using. Get your answer. Type it in there. The good news is the remaining questions are pretty similar to what you've seen. I think three and four are really similar. Some of these are inverse normal. Some are normal CDF. Um, and I think it'll help you to do these back to back. Like three, I talked you through a whole lot, kind of told you some of the calculator functions you're using. I'm not gonna tell you any of them on problem four. So do problem four all on your own and see if you can get it. And if you can't, go back to problem three because I think you'll find they're very closely related. Only comment I have here is in question three, they wanted you to round probabilities to four decimal places, meaning leave them as a decimal, not a percentage. In question four, it says percentage. So they want them as a percentage rounded to two decimal places. So again, if this were your answer, in problem four, you would type in 15.73. In problem three, you type in 0.1573. So be careful on that. Question four, pretty similar to the last couple. I don't think I have any real comments here. Um, we're talking about mice, apparently. They tell you the mean. They tell you the standard deviation. Fine. What is the probability that? Maybe there's a red flag for you right there. And you can figure out which calculator function you're using, figure out what number goes here, similarly here, here, and then down here. And hint, you'll be using both inverse norm and normal CDF on this problem. So look at A, B, C, and D and see if you can identify which are which. And it takes a while to get comfortable with that, but don't kind of guess and check your way there. That's knowledge you're definitely going to want to have when you leave this section. You want to be good with the difference between these two calculator functions. And if you're not, maybe go back to those videos and watch them one more time. Or maybe look at old quizzes that cover inverse norm and normal CDF and get that knowledge that you need for this section. Problem six, more of the same. Uh, 3.1 calculator functions. It's kind of a long assignment, just like 3.1 empirical rule was. And that's because I know from experience that students struggle with this. And look, if you struggle with the difference between a statistic and parameter, the 1.1 to 1.5 stuff, I don't really care that much. It's not a big deal. But if you struggle with this, it's going to continue to come back to bite you as this class goes on. And that's kind of a bummer. So that's why I really want students solid with this stuff. This one's asking some questions. Uh, what is the probability that? And then note, no mention of percentages here, so it wants it as a decimal. 
Some of these are normal CBS, some of these are inverse norm. You figure out which are which and answer the questions. Seven is another one that's kind of more the same. If I remember right, this one was just kind of hard. Uh, talking about warranties, and it's just hard to read these problems and convert them into the appropriate pictures. Um, it's hard to read them and know what you're doing, I guess is what I'm saying. I really recommend you draw the pictures. I know a lot of these, you could probably answer the questions by going straight to your calculator and not draw the pictures. This one especially, it's just hard. It's easy to shade in the wrong direction. It's easy for things to go wrong. If you're struggling with this, you might want to draw the pictures. Number eight's a little bit weird. It's kind of this one that's not like the others. Uh, I left this in here. I debated taking it out. I debated getting rid of it. But it turns out that number eight will be similar to what you're doing in the second half of the class in such a way that I wanted you to get some practice with it. So you're like, whoa, this looks totally different. I'm used to questions about the mean weight of mice or weddings in the Caribbean or whatever the hell the problems are about. This one's not. In this one, all they give you are z-scores. So the z-score here, this zero is a z-score. This means that we're talking about something. I don't know what we're talking about. And that something has a mean. And I don't even know what the mean is. But the mean goes right here. Maybe that mean is 100. Fine. The mean's not pictured. All that's pictured is a zero. That zero means we are zero standard deviations above or below the mean. So I don't know what the mean is, and I don't know what the standard deviation is, but I do know that if I were to label the bottom of this picture here, I would have put the mean here, and one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations. And so what this question is asking you to figure out is what is the z-score that corresponds with this edge of the shaded region? And what is the z-score that corresponds with this edge of the shaded region? And you're like, I don't know how to figure out the z-score stuff. I don't know how to do that in my calculator. Okay, first, figure out if it's inverse normal, normal CDF. Then when you figure that out, I think you'll know that since 86% is shaded, maybe you could figure out how much is not shaded. And if you know how much is not shaded, maybe you could figure out how much is not shaded over here and not shaded over here. And then you'll have your picture really well labeled and you'll, be, you'll have most of the inputs for the calculator function you wanna use. The, what you'll be missing is the center and the spread. But it turns out that since you want a Z-score, you don't even have to put in center and spread. Put in zero for the center and one for the spread, and then the answer your calculator will give you will be a z-score, which is what it wants in the first place. So what I'm saying is do this problem just like all the previous ones, except when it asks for the center and the spread, put in zero and one. And that won't be specific to this problem. That'll be anytime we have z-scores, anytime we want normalized values on the bottom of our distribution. You do that twice, you get those two answers, they go here and here. The negative z-score, this one goes here, and the positive z-score, this one goes here. Um, if you want, view this one as extra credit, right? I, there's, I build in extra credit on these homework assignments for problems that are a little bit weird. This one's a little bit weird. Get it if you can get it. If you don't get it, don't worry about it a whole lot. We'll have plenty of time later in the class to review this topic. That's all I got for this homework assignment.